Amen. So I say amen. I love how God confirms his word. We haven't talked. It's been amazing. So I feel like God's got a word for us. And so before we get started, we're going to dismiss training camp, dismiss our nurseries. If you haven't had a chance to give yet, I'll have a couple guys coming back with the boxes. That's good. Thank you, sir. Amen. Man, what a sweet presence of the Lord here today. Amen. Amen. Excited for Memorial Weekend. I just want to take a moment and honor those who have served and fought and died for our country. I don't want to forget what Memorial Weekend is more than boats and cookouts and barbecues and, and family. Those are all good things, but there's a reason why we celebrate. Amen. Amen. I'm excited for the word today. I've got a word this morning. I, I, sometimes you wonder if, if, if you know, if it's, if it's the right timing and all that, and, and I'm so grateful that God... He, he understands my personal insecurities and, and does it in a way to confirm what he's speaking to my heart. And so that's a good thing. And so if you have your Bible with me, turn to Joshua chapter number four. Joshua chapter number four. We're going to share just for a few minutes this morning what I believe God has put on my heart to, to really confirm what he's already said this morning through scripture, what he's been speaking. Joshua chapter four. Verse number one says this, when all the people had crossed the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, now choose 12 men, one from each tribe. Tell them, take 12 stones from the very place where the priests are standing in the middle of the Jordan. Carry them out and pile them up at the place where you will camp tonight. So Joshua called together the 12 men he had chosen, one from each tribe of Israel. He told them, go into the middle of the Jordan in front of the ark of the Lord your God. Each one of you must pick up one stone and carry it out on your shoulder, 12 stones in all, for one of each of the 12 tribes of Israel. We will use these stones to build a memorial. In the future, your children will ask you, what do these stones mean? Then you can tell them they remind us of the Jordan River stopped flowing when the Ark of the Lord's Covenant went across. These stones will stand as a memorial among the people of Israel forever. And so the men did as Joshua had commanded them. They took 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan River, one for each tribe, just as the Lord had told Joshua. And they carried them to the place where they camped for the night and constructed a memorial there. And so we have the children of Israel. They've, 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 they've crossed. They're crossing the Jordan River. They've been moving around the wilderness for, for the, all of this time. They're getting ready to, to cross into their promised land. They're getting ready to move in. They come to the Jordan River. The Lord splits it open. They walk across on dry ground. They've seen something that's impossible. And they've crossed. I love how God makes memorials out of things that should be impossible. Right? And so walking across on dry ground, and then God is saying, I want you to remember what happened today. I want you to remember what I can do. I want you to remember what I can do. What I can do with you and in you and through you. I want you to remember. I want your children to remember. So set up this memorial. And so the 12 men representing the 12 tribes, they grab 12 stones and they place it there right where the priest stood in the middle. That's where they got them from. And then they set up this memorial to remind them of their experience with God, to remind them of this experience. No matter what's coming their way, they'll have something they can look back on and always remember what God did for them. But not just to remind them of what God did for them, but to be a testimony for the generations to come. Verse number six says, your children will ask you, what do these mean? And it's to inform the next generation of what God can do. What God can do. So this past week, I was in Indianapolis, and I was at a conference in Indy. And I have to go do this every, every year. So I'm down there in Indianapolis. I'm at the convention center. And... I don't know if this is off subject, but, man, our convention center is huge. You get down, you don't realize how big this convention center is. In, in little old Indiana, we got one of the biggest convention centers, I think, in America. This place was big. But we're down there, 
And I'm in this, and I'm in this conference, and there's, there's probably 1,500 of us that are there, um, all ranging all kinds of stuff, and uh, all over the counties of Indiana. We're all there. It's, it's for probation and corrections, and we're sitting in there, and they get the speaker up, and he begins talking about fidelity. He begins talking about fidelity, you know, what we're doing and, and making sure that we're, we're doing what we say we set out we want to do, right? And so I'm sitting in this, in this session about fidelity, and there's about 1,200 sitting, and I got I to gotta be honest, my eyes were about glazed over. I texted my wife, and after about the first hour, I, I'm a fingernail biter. I know it's terrible, but that's I, all my life. And my fingers were bleeding because I was trying to stay awake from, you know, chewing on my fingers. And I'd gone through a pack of gum in an hour, and I was struggling. But in the middle of that struggle, the Lord began to speak to me. And we have this term that we call, we call drift. And drift for us is when there's a place that you're, you know you want to be, but over time, things happen. Over time, you do things, and before long, you begin to drift away from where you were wanting to be. Right? And I began to think about this, and the Lord began to talk to me about drift, and he began to talk to me about fidelity, and he began to talk to me about these things, and he brought this scripture to mind and, and about what memorials, what things will I have set up that I can look to that will keep me from drifting, that will keep me from over time when life happens, when stuff happens, when, when, when I go away doing something over and over sometimes, and you do it a little bit different the next day and a little bit different the next day, and you get away from some of these intended things, and all of a sudden you look back and you're nowhere where you thought you were supposed to be. You've drifted, right? So the Lord began to talk to me about what memorials, Mike, do you have set up that will keep you where you want to be? That will kind of keep you on track. This guidepost for you that you know if you can see this memorial, if you can see this place, if you can see this thing, you know you're you want to be. I don't know if I'm messing up the mic or if the mic's just messing up or I'm moving around too much. But where do I want to keep my focus? What do I need to help me focus so I don't drift? What do I need my children to remember? What do I want my grandchildren to know about my God that keeps us from drifting, that keeps us from getting too far away, that keeps us in the right place? What are those things that I want them to know? And there's a, there's a lot of things, and I promise today I'm not going to give you 12 for the 12 stones, I promise. And just We're just going to do a couple today. What I feel for me are, 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 are my foundational ones. What I build my foundation on, what we were just seeing about, again, God, confirming his word. You're going to hear his word being confirmed today. There are several, but there's a couple places where I start. As I begin to think about it, he began to solidify me. Mike, what are those things that you're using that keeps you from drifting? What are those stones that I'm setting down, that I'm grabbing from what God has done for me that helps me remember who he is? Amen? So if I was going to think about it, my first stone that I named that I set down, that I set down for my memorial, that I set down, that I set up, that I set down, that I want to remember, that I want my kids to remember. That first stone for me is always God is for me. He loves me. He is for me and he loves me. That's the stone that I want to have foundational in my life that I never forget. No matter what's going on in my life, I can look back from wherever I am and I can see that God is for me, and he loves me. Our perception of God will always determine how we respond to him. Our perception of God will always determine how we respond to him. And so I need my perception to always be he loves me, and he is for me. No matter what's going on, he loves me, and he is for me. He loves me, and he is for me. 1 John 4 and 9 says, God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. This is real love. His love was never dependent upon us. It was always dependent upon him. Right? It's all about his character. It has nothing to do with my character. His love is all about his character. He loves me, and he's for me. I could etch Romans on here on this stone as well. God is for me. Who can be against me? 
Can anything separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean we're no longer going to have problems, troubles, or calamities, or confusions? No, it just means overwhelming victory is ours through Christ Jesus who loves us. And I love verse 38, and I am convinced that nothing can ever separate me from God's love. Not death, not life, nor angels, nor demons, nor fears for today or worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate me from the love of God. My first stone, my first thing, my foundational piece is God loves me. And he is for me. He is for me. He knew me. He loved me. He chose me. He adopted me. He gives me victory. And he continues to love me. It has nothing to do with me. He loves me because I breathe. Amen. He loves us because we're here. And he's for us because we're here. He loves us. He knows us. There are so many scriptures. Lamentations 3 says, certainly the faithful love of the Lord hasn't ended. Certainly God's compassion isn't through, but they are renewed every morning. He loves me completely even when I'm incomplete. And he loves me perfectly even when I'm imperfect. He loves me. He's for me. And that love is removed, is renewed every morning. Every morning morning. Wrap my head around that. Every morning, every morning when I wake up, his love is renewed. In fact, his love is renewed when the clock hits 12, 0, 0, midnight. His love is renewed for me. His love is renewed for me. In my darkest hour, his love is renewing. His love for me is renewing. His grace for me is renewing. I found this scripture this week. I love it. Ephesians 3.18. And you may have the power, and may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide and how long and how high and how deep is his love. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide and how long and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then you'll be made complete and have the power that comes from God. God loves us, stone number one. God loves us and he's for us. I've got to know that. I've got to have that foundational piece in my life. I have to see that to know that I'm not drifting. I can't get too far away from understanding that God loves me. I can't get too far away from understanding that he is for me. He is for me. Stone number one, God loves me, and he is for me. Stone number two, I've said this before. This is one of my favorites. God's got me. God's got me. God's got me. The second thing that I have to remember, the second thing that I want my kids to be sure of, the second thing I want this church to be sure of, the second thing that I want to keep me from drifting is to understand and to always know that God has got me. He has got me. He is well aware of everything that's going on in my life. There isn't anything happening to me that takes him by surprise. There isn't anything going on that takes God by surprise. He is not surprised. He is not surprised. He is well aware, and he's got me. 1 John 4, 13 says, and God has given us his spirit as proof that we live in him, and he lives in us. If Holy Spirit is in us, if we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, we believe that, then where we are, he is also. Everywhere my feet walk, he walks with me. Everywhere I go, he's there. And if he's there, anything is possible, right? In our good times, he's there. In our mountaintop experiences, he's there. He's always there. He's there when the good things are going on. He's there when I'm riding high, right? We know that. We feel that. We, we can talk about the blessings of God. Every time, I see, every time I see my blessing, I know God is riding right beside me, right? We can see that. That's easy to see. That's easy to understand when things are going well. When I'm 
going from mountain to mountain to mountain. He is right there with me. He's causing some of my mountains, top experiences. He is there. He is there. It's easy to know that. But what about the low times? What about the difficult times? What about the times when things aren't going so well? He's still there. When I'm struggling, he's still there. You need to write this verse down, Deuteronomy 33. Deuteronomy 33. Deuteronomy 33, 26. There is no one like the God of Israel. He rides across the heavens to help you. Across the skies in his majestic splendor. Yeah, I said wow too. There is, I'm going to stop. There is no God like the God of Israel. Oh, that'll preach right there. There is no God like the God of Israel. There is no God. He rides across the heavens to help you, across the skies in majestic splendor. The eternal God is your refuge, and his everlasting arms are under you. He drives out the enemy before you, and he cries out, destroy them. No one is like the God of Israel. He rides across to help you across the skies in majestic splendor. That's good stuff. Majestic splendor, riding across the heavens to help us. I could just picture him. He's riding across on this white horse, and I can see the majestic stars bouncing around behind him as he's going from place to place looking to help us. What an amazing picture. What an amazing picture that is. The eternal God, the eternal God is your refuge. The eternal God, the God who was at the beginning And who is at the end? The God who is the Alpha and the Omega. The God who is always there, always is, always was, and always will be. He is our refuge. He is our strong tower where we can run in and to be saved. He is. He is that God. That eternal God. That eternal God. That everlasting God. He is there and he's got me. And he's got me. He's got me. But there's something else. There's something else. I know you don't see it yet, but there's something else. It's this part right here. It's this part that, 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 that solidified in me. It's this part right here that, that I, I want to bring out. His everlasting arms are under you. His everlasting, his never tiring arms are under you. If we look at the... At, at, at the Hebrew there, it's, it's takoth. It means it's beneath you. It's below you. It's at the bottom of where you are. It's at the bottom. So you know what? When you're at your low place, guess what? His arms are beneath that. When you're going through struggles, his arms are there. When I'm going through the valleys of the shadow of death, I can fear no evil. Why? Because he's already at the bottom. He's already there. His everlasting, never-ending arms are already underneath me holding me up. I may be struggling, but his arms are there. I may be going through it, but his arms are there. I may be struggling with my addictions, but his arms are already there. I may be going through some loss, but his arms are right there. They're always underneath me. I may fall down, but I won't fall through because his arms are underneath me. They're always underneath me. He's got me. Even in my struggle, he's got me. When I'm hurting, he's got me. When I'm sad, he's got me. When I'm struggling with my anxiety, he's got me. When I'm in my low points, he's already there with his everlasting arms holding me up. He's already beneath me. He's got 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 me. That's a stone that I don't drift too far away from. He's got me because life is going to happen. And when it happens, I have to know, I have to have my foundation built on this fact that even when I'm at my lowest point, he's still there. And his arms are never growing tired holding me up. His everlasting, ever-loving arms are there holding me up. I may fall down, but I'll never fall through. Because his arms are right there. He's got me. He 
he's got me. He's got me. He's got me. When I'm at my lowest point, when I'm in my valleys, he's got me. When I make my mistakes, he's still there and he's got me. When I'm struggling for answers, he's got me. When I'm struggling with my family, he's got me. When life's throwing curveballs, he's still got me. I'm setting the stone because I want my kids to understand whatever they go through, he's there and he's got them. He's got them on their mountaintops, and he's got them in their valleys. He's got them in their successes. He's got them in their weaknesses. He's got them when they do the right thing, and he's got them when they do the wrong thing. He's got them. I want my grandkids to see those stones and to know and to know and to know no matter what this world is going on, I can't even imagine what this world is going to look like when I got grandkids. But it doesn't matter because he's got them. It doesn't matter what's happening in Washington because he's got us. It doesn't matter what's happening at the state house because he's got us. It doesn't matter what's happening in my schools because he's got me. It's the stone that I'm building my foundation on. He's got me. He's got me. He's got me. He's got me. He's got you. Even when I stumble and fall, I won't fall through because he's got me. God loves me, and he's for me, and he's got me, and he's got me. And stone number three, this has three parts. Everybody else gets three closings, so my point gets three parts. Stone number three, I have everything I need. I have everything I need for anything I may face. I have everything I need for anything I may face. So it doesn't matter what's coming my way. I have everything I need for anything I may face. It's like that's a, that's a bold statement because you don't know what's coming, and that's all right. I don't have to because I set the stone. I have everything I need for anything I may face. So what do you got? 1 Peter 1.3 says, by his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. <clears throat> for God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. So what has he given us? He's given us spiritual gifts, spiritual fruit, and faith. Spiritual gifts, spiritual fruit, and faith. He's given a spiritual gift. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 says a spiritual gift is given to each of us, not just someone, not just some ones. But a spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. Words of wisdom, words of knowledge, faith, healing, miracles, prophecy, discernment, gift of tongues, and interpretation of tongues. It's not just given to some, but there's gifts given to each of us. It's important you know that you have gifts. I'm not going to preach the gifts. That's not my assignment today. So if you don't know what gift you have, if you don't know how to operate in your gift or if you're operating in it wrongly, go see Pastor Lucas. He's got a class for this. They just finished, right? I'm plugging, I'm plugging. Don't miss it, don't miss it. If you haven't been in it, get in it. You need it. Because you have what you need. The problem is we don't use what we have. And so if you're not using a spiritual gift, you need to get in his class so you can recognize what is my gift and how do I use it appropriately? I'm going to underscore appropriately also. Because you can be dangerous with a gift you don't know how to use. And that's not my assignment either, so I'm going to stop there. You have spiritual gifts. We heard them today, gift of tongues, gift of interpretation of tongues. We heard both of those this morning. We operate in those in this church. They are still in operation today. We believe in them and we use them. They confirmed a word today that he is in us. He used these gifts this morning for me, if for nobody else, for me, to confirm that this is a word for today. They're in operation today. You have gifts. What are you doing with them? <clears throat> See, Pastor Lucas. We have fruits of the Spirit. Galatians 5.22 but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. 
We established earlier that the Holy Spirit was in us, and we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So if the Holy Spirit is in us, these fruits are in us also. Because the Holy Spirit produces those fruits in our lives. The question is, are we accessing them? You have it. Do you use it? I can love someone who hates me because I can access the love that's in me. I can have peace in troubling times because peace is growing on the inside of me. I just have to access it. I can be joyful in times when things aren't going my way because joy is growing on the inside of me. I just have to access it. Whatever is going on in my life, patience, when I get all anxious and excited and can't wait for something to happen and I'm all this way and that way, there is peace on the inside of me that I can access to say, slow down. Let me work. Let me work. It's in me. The problem is I don't always access it. But it doesn't mean it's not there. It doesn't mean we don't have what we need. Maybe we just need to access what we have. It's in us. It's in us. It's in us. I have what I need for anything that may come my way. I can choose kindness when encountering people who are mistreating me because it's in me. It's in me. I have what I need because he's producing it in me. And maybe the most important thing is faith. Romans 12, 3 says God has given each of us a measure of faith. That means God has seen you. He's looked at your life. We've already established he's not surprised what's coming your way. So he has given you the faith you need for what you got going on. He's given to each of us a measure. That means he's measured it out. He knows what kind of faith you need. He's measured it out. He said, well, I don't know, Mike. I've got big problems and my faith looks real small. My faith looks real little. I'm struggling here. I'm struggling. I'm looking at my stuff, and I just don't know if my faith is big enough for this. And we all know the scripture that's in Matthew. If you have the faith the size of a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and there will be nothing that's impossible for you. And I was sitting in my office this week, and, man, God began to hit me. I've, I've heard this scripture a hundred times. He showed me, so every, it's this thing. Every time I get there, it goes out. He began to show me something. I want you to catch this. I want you to catch this. I want you to catch this. If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can move this mountain from here to there, and it'll move, and nothing will be impossible for you. I don't believe that God used illustrations haphazardly. So I begin to think about faith. As a mustard seed, for me, it was always just about if you have, even if your faith is little, you can do big things. And I believe that. I believe that. I believe that. I believe that. But I begin to look at something else. It's faith the size of a mustard seed. And all of a sudden, big, bold letters, this thing popped up at me. Seed. Faith. He likened faith or compared faith to a seed, and even a small seed, but a seed. So I did what anybody else would do when something gets highlighted. I go to Google. So I'm I'm no horticulturalist. Is that the word? Yeah, I'm, I'm not one of those guys. So I went to Google, and I asked Google, tell me about this mustard seed. Tell me about the mustard plant, the mustard tree. And I found out a couple of things, and this isn't a horticultural lesson. I can't say that word, but just pretend like I said it right. But this is what I found out. I found out that it's a fairly small tree or plant, often classified as a shrub. So it grows up, not that, not that big of a deal. Water-seeking roots. This is interesting. Water-seeking roots. It can survive in any kind of soil. It grows fast. Its fruit is a good source of antioxidants and is believed to be helpful in preventing various diseases. 
So what's the point? I'm going to tell you. The point is this. It's not about how big your faith looks. It's understanding that you have enough faith you need if we'll just plant it in the middle of what we got going on. This mustard seed plant, it's got roots that seek out water. It goes out and it seeks out water, which means it can survive when the temperature is hot and dry or it can survive when it's raining and it's moist. It doesn't matter the atmosphere. It's going to grow and it's going to grow fast. And it's going to produce a fruit that is going to be helpful, that is going to provide sustenance and be helpful. So what am I saying today? I'm saying that we just have a little bit of faith. If we'll plant it in the middle of our situation, it doesn't matter what season you're going through. It doesn't matter what the atmosphere around you looks like. It will find what it needs. It will find the Holy Spirit living inside of you, and it will begin to grow. And it will grow, and it will pop through, right? What does a seed do? A seed, it has to go through the soil. It has to break through the soil. It has to break through the dirt. It has to spread out. It has to survive the rocks. It has to survive the wind. It has to survive the rain. It has to survive the animals. It has to survive what everything else that's going on to grow. What God is saying is you've got faith that's just like that. If you'll plant it in your situation and watch it grow, it will grow. Your faith can survive anything you're going through. It can survive the tough life. It can survive the rocks. It can survive the wind and the rain. It can survive the storms of life. If you'll plan it, it will work for you. You've got the faith for whatever you've got going on in your life. Just plan it in your situation and watch what God will do with it. You have enough faith for what you're going through. And when I plant it in my situation, when I plant it there, and I let it grow, and I let it seek out Holy Spirit and join with Holy Spirit, and I let it break through, that's when nothing is impossible for me. It's at that point that nothing is impossible because there's nothing that can stop it from growing. You've got the faith for this. You have what you need for anything you're going through. I've got to set that in my life. I'm not drifting too far from that one. I want that one to sit in the middle of what I've got going on. I have what I need. I just need to access it and I need to plan it access those gifts. I need to understand my gifts. I need to access my fruit, and I need to plant my faith. If I'll do those three things, there isn't anything that I can't accomplish. There isn't anything I'll go through that can defeat me. Even my valleys, they can't defeat me. Even my low points, they can't defeat me. Even my hurts, my habits, my struggles, they can't defeat me. I have what I need. If I'll understand my gifts, if I'll access my fruit, and if I'll plant my faith, nothing is impossible for me. Nothing is impossible for me. And that's what I want to remember. Those are my foundational stones. Those are those, that's, that's where I'm starting. That's where I'm starting. Understanding God loves me, and he's for me. He loves me, and he's for me. Understanding that he's got me. I may fall down, but I won't fall through because he has me. And then I have everything I need for anything I'm getting ready to face. Amen. Brandon, you can come. They just said I'm done. God's got me. I have everything I need for whatever I'm facing. And I really believe, I really believe, I really believe that For most of us, we believe that this is true. But sometimes due to drift, I think sometimes in our low places, sometimes in our struggles, sometimes in our issues, we begin to wonder, is it true for me? I understand God's love. God loves Lucas. But does he love me? I know know that God loves my mom. She's as close to God as I know. But does he love me all the time? I don't know. 
Sometimes when I'm drifting, I decide I have to get back to this place that I know. He loves me and he's for me. Does he really have me or have I fallen too far? Have I made too many mistakes? Do I have, do I really have what I need? Do I really have the faith for my struggles? I think God is wanting us, and we heard the words today. We heard the, the, the vision that Pastor Nate had. We heard the, 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 the prophetic gift in tongues today that he's in us. So I believe God is wanting us, if, if we're struggling with those thoughts, if we're struggling with those things, if we're struggling with understanding any of those concepts, maybe it's in this place that God is wanting us to set some stones, to set some foundations, to set some memorials, that will help me always remember these things. Always remember these things about him. He's wanting us to set these in our life. Then this intersection between what's true for others and what's true for me, the devil oftentimes plays. That's where he likes to play with my mind in this intersection of I know it's true for others, but is it true for me? It's there that my thoughts begin to wander. It's there that sometimes I start to drift. It's there that sometimes I start to roll over. And it's in this intersection. It's in this place that I'm setting my stones that says it's here. I know he loves me. It's here that I know he's for me. It's here that I know in my highest of highs and in my lowest of lows, he's got me. He's got me. He's got me. And it's here that I know no matter what comes my way, I've got what I need. It doesn't matter. Whatever's coming my way, I have what I need to get through it. Doesn't mean it won't come. Just means I can get through it. I think that's been one of the things as church people we focused that a life with God was all mountaintops sometimes. And with God, thing, it is mountaintops, but with this world, we have to go through some stuff. In this earthly life, we still have to go through things. And he knew that. And so he gave us what we need to walk through it. I may fall, but I won't fall through because I have what I need. I have what I need. I have what I need. Stand with me today. I'm just going to invite you this morning just to set these in your life. Set these solid in your life. God, God loves me and is for me. He loves me and he's for me. He's got me and I have everything I need. He's got me and I have everything I need. Amen. I'm going to pray for us this morning. Father, we thank you today. We thank you, Lord, that you love us. We can set this in stone and we can place it in our life. It is foundation to everything. You love us and it doesn't depend upon us. It doesn't matter anything about us. It's all about you and your character. You love us and you're for us. You love us and you're for us. You love us and you're for, and you're for us. And we set as a stone in our life. And Father, you've got me. It doesn't matter where I am. You have me. When I'm high, you have me. When I'm low, you have me. When I'm doing the right thing, you have me. When I'm making mistakes, you still have me. I'm setting this stone in my life. It's foundational. I won't drift from this. You've got me. You've got me. You've got me. And come hell or high water, I have everything I need for whatever I'm going through. It doesn't matter. You've provided a way for me. You've provided a way for me. Give me the wisdom to access what I need when I need it. You said whoever to ask for wisdom, you grant. We ask for wisdom today that we will access what we need when we need it. That we'll plant our faith in any situation and watch it grow. We love you today, Holy Spirit. We honor you. We thank you for being alive in our life and producing what we need. We thank you today. We set these stones in our life today that we won't drift to the left or to the right, but we'll stand on them. 
give you thanks. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.